my screen so we can get started. So like Jamie said, we are starting a series where we're going to deep dive into the most common types of dementia. And again, Alzheimer's disease being the most common uh, type form cause of dementia. And we'll look specifically at more about that. There's some information about us here at the West Center, our outline, my information and objectives for those of you who are getting your CE today. So let's look at the latest statistics, the latest statistics that we've got from the Alzheimer's Association. And they put out uh, new statistics each year, but let's look at some of these statistics right now. One of the ones that really stands out, I think, that one that says in 2022, Alzheimer's and other dementias will cost the nation $321 billion. By 2050, these costs could reach nearly $1 trillion. And then, of course, those of you that are on that are family caregivers. More than 11 million Americans provide unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's and other dementias. Right along with that statistic, in 2021, caregivers providing more than 16 billion hours of care valued at nearly 272 billion. Those kind of numbers are just so much we can't even fathom. But now we've got some COVID-19 statistics. COVID-19 contributing to a 17% increase in Alzheimer's and dementia deaths. Those of you that are on that are professionals and we're working in the field the last few years, you saw it as well as we did. What happened during that shutdown? One in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or another dementia, and that it kills more than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. But we're just starting to talk about it. We're just really starting to hear about it. Celebrity families are finally coming forward and owning this disease. So maybe, maybe we'll start getting some money pushed toward the cure. And that last one there, more than 6 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's. By 2050, this number is projected to rise to nearly 13 million. Seventy-three percent of people who are living with dementia right now in the United States are over the age of 75, over the age of 75. But then, you know, I um, use the story of having a 47-year-old in our day program, and that shocks a lot of people. Yes, we do typically see it in older folks but it isn't always the case. Let's look at some of these other statistics, 2022 statistics. Almost two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women. Think about why that is. Women do tend to live longer than men, even though both men and women took a big dive the last couple of years in life expectancy. Older Black Americans are about twice as likely to have Alzheimer's or other dementias as older white Americans. And older Hispanics are about one and one half times as likely to have Alzheimer's or other dementias as older white Americans. We'll talk a lot more about that, specifically whenever we do vascular dementia, the types of vascular diseases that we see. Look at the statistics for hospital stays. People living with dementia have twice as many hospital stays per year as other people. And those of you, again, who have that family member that has dementia, we know that is the absolute worst place for them to be. We would think that our doctors and nurses are all trained in memory care, but the fact is that for most of them, it was a chapter in a book a long time ago. 
And if this isn't their field, why would we expect them to be specialist in it? They're not. And then here's a statistic specific to Texas. In 2020, there were about 400,000 people living with dementia. That number's projected to be 22.5% by 2025. Let's start by watching. This is a three minute video that's going to really kind of set the stage for what's happening with Alzheimer's disease. What is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's is a slow, fatal disease of the brain affecting one in 10 people over the age of 65. No one is immune. The disease comes on gradually as two abnormal protein fragments called plaques and tangles accumulate in the brain and kill brain cells. They start here in the hippocampus, the part of the brain where memories are first formed. Over many years time, the plaques and tangles slowly destroy the hippocampus and it becomes harder and harder to form new memories. Simple recollections from a few hours or days ago that the rest of us might take for granted are just not there. After that, more plaques and tangles spread into different regions of the brain, killing cells and compromising function wherever they go. This spreading around is what causes the different stages of Alzheimer's. From the hippocampus, the disease spreads here to the region of the brain where language is processed. When that happens, it gets tougher and tougher to find the right word. Next, the disease creeps toward the front of the brain where logical thought takes place. Very gradually, a person begins to lose the ability to solve problems, grasp concepts, and make plans. Next, the plaques and tangles invade the part of the brain where emotions are regulated. When this happens, the patient gradually loses control over moods and feelings. After that, the disease moves to where the brain makes sense of things it sees, hears, and smells. In this stage, Alzheimer's wreaks havoc on a person's senses and can spark hallucinations. Eventually, the plaques and tangles erase a person's oldest and most precious memories, which are stored here in the back of the brain. Near the end, the disease compromises a person's balance and coordination. And in the very last stage, it destroys the part of the brain that regulates breathing and the heart. The progression from mild forgetting to death is slow and steady and takes place over an average of eight to 10 years. It is relentless and for now, incurable. Helping your family, friends and neighbors to better understand Alzheimer's will reduce stigma, improve care, and even help the fight for a cure. Thanks for helping to do your part. Now, I know some of you, as you were listening to that, especially if you're a family caregiver, were probably really shaking your head. Because typically, all we know about this disease, when we hear that word, even the word dementia, is memory loss. That's all we know. You didn't know what you didn't know. And you've got to have some grace with yourself for not knowing so many of those other things that that video mentioned that are part of dementia or part of Alzheimer's. Now, I do want you to keep in mind that not everybody's progression may be um, as systematic as that video showed. It kind of showed it going from this to this to this to that. You really can't check those boxes and say, okay, this is what's coming next. But all dementias are progressive. And many of them, most of them have the same symptoms, not necessarily in any particular order. So just keep that in mind also as we move through this series. This is a great graphic because it talks, it shows that that word dementia is an umbrella term. The word dementia is the umbrella term. 
And then underneath that umbrella are the different types, kinds, forms, causes of dementia. There's over 130 different types of dementia. But as you can see there, Alzheimer's disease is the most common. Some statistics show that up to 80% of all dementias is Alzheimer's disease. So that's the one we hear about the most often. There's other umbrella terms. The word cancer is an umbrella term. And if someone said their loved one had cancer, we would ask what kind or what type. It's the same thing with dementia. If someone says that their loved one has dementia, what kind or what type of dementia? We're going to look at a scan in just a little bit that's going to show what's actually happening to the brain of somebody who has dementia. The brain is beginning to atrophy. The brain is beginning to shrink, which means the brain is dying. The brain cells are dying. Now, when we look at this picture that's going to be coming up and we put it side by side, a normal brain is about three pounds. Our brain is about three pounds. A person at the end stage of dementia, it's going to be about one pound. We cannot expect those two people to behave and act the same way. We can't. The brain's dying. So some of the things that we may see first are changes in their social skills, changes in judgment, language changes, personality changes, the ability to take care of themselves. Because there are so many steps in personal care. It's sequencing. And they lose the ability to be able to see, do sequencing. We've got a bullet point here that says Alzheimer's disease is a type of brain disease, just like COPD is a type of heart or vascular disease. It is degenerative. It is progressive, meaning that it does get worse over time. And all of the dementias are terminal. We don't have a cure and we don't have a treatment. We do have some memory meds, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, but they aren't reversing anything. So those are the most common dementias that you see there, Alzheimer's, Lewy body, vascular, frontotemporal, and then there are many, many, many other forms of dementia. You see on there, they've got Parkinson's and Huntington's. And then you notice at the bottom, it says mixed dementia. That is now the second most common type of dementia is mixed dementia. And all that means is that the person has two or more different types of dementia, the most common being Alzheimer's and vascular together, meaning that they have some type of a vascular issue. We'll talk more about vascular next month. Now, just that word dementia, the word dementia does not mean memory loss. We tend to use those words like they're synonyms. Dementia is a loss of cognitive functioning and it interferes with a person's day-to-day -day life and their activities. These are some of the most common things that we see, but there's about 36 common symptoms. But of course, memory is first, usually immediate memory, and then short-term and eventually long-term. Being able to be reasonable or rational starts to go away in a lot of folks pretty early, especially with Alzheimer's disease where you can argue all day long and you're not going to win because they can't be reasonable or rational. That's located in this front of the brain and the brain's beginning to shrink and it goes away. Being able to pay attention or focus, their language skills are going to change. And we're going to look at why that is. Personality, and we've got that word behavior on there because sometimes we start saying they start having some challenging behaviors. We try to use the word expressions. They're having some challenging expressions. They're doing the best they can with what remains of their brain. We've talked about being able to take care of themselves, that personal care, sensory input and output, and eventually their movement and their coordination is going to be affected. Their brain is dying. Here's some of the risk factors, being over the age of 65, having a family history. We found that in Alzheimer's disease, about 30% of the time, it will be in families. Although when I talk to families, uh, they will say, 
you know, my dad and my aunt and his, you know, that that they see it a lot, but the number is about 30%. Gender, we talked about, we do see more women having had a head trauma, traumatic brain injury, multiple concussions, somebody who has had a lifetime of smoking or drinking, cardiovascular diseases is what's going to really uh, contribute to vascular dementia, uncontrolled high blood pressure, cholesterol, obesity, diabetes. And now there is a link between unmanaged depression, lifelong depression and dementia, because it actually, we now know it changes the brain chemistry and it permanently changes the brain chemistry. And that's something that we can do something about is depression. And then environmental toxins and lifestyle, poor nutrition, limited physical, mental, and social activity. And there's actually some statistics that show that at autopsy, as many as 80% of people who have Alzheimer's disease when they die also had some type of cardiovascular disease. That's why the rise in that mixed dementia where people have the two types together. Now, here are some of those warning signs of dementia. I don't want you to look at this and panic yourself thinking, oh my goodness, I can never find my keys. I don't know where my phone is. Where are my glasses? They're on my head. Most of that is stress. Or aging and not by memory loss, but by slowing down. There is no age-related memory loss, regardless of what the commercials tell you. We should not have any memory loss. We should slow down. We're not able to multitask as much anymore. But here are some of the things that we really need to look for in our loved ones and in ourselves. Disorientation to time and place. Not like what we did today where we went, wait a minute, I've been off for four days. Isn't this Monday? It feels like Monday. We know it's not really Monday. But people with dementia are really confused about time and place. There's judgment again, misplacing things. Butter's in the cabinet, oatmeal's in the refrigerator because that's where it goes. Reasonable or rational, can't do it. Problems keeping track of things. Images and spatial relationships. I had a resident one time who was still driving. The son rode in the car with her. She was stopping at the stoplights, looking both ways and going. She was treating the stoplight as a stop sign. And then starting to withdraw socially. Those are some other things you might be seeing. Now, what's interesting about Alzheimer's disease is that they begin really believe that it can begin up to 20 years before those first symptoms start to arise. The changes in the brain can be happening up to 20 years before the symptoms. The brain, and we're going to talk more about this, and you saw it in that video where they're starting to develop plaque on their brain. Plaque and tangles are the words you may have heard before. As the disease is progressing, those neurons are damaged. Eventually, they're destroyed. And in that particular area where those brain cells die, that then affects, because if that particular area was um, my ability to be rational, then that's gone. Eventually, it's gone. For a while, it's almost like it comes and goes. If they've had a good night's sleep, if they've taken their medicine, they ate a good meal, especially earlier in the day, they may be a little more clear. And as the day goes on, I got upset about something. I didn't rest. The weather's bad. I just, and I can't. And you may see more of those expressions or behaviors. Now, people always ask, what's the progression? How much time are we talking about? Statistically, on average, a person lives four to eight years after diagnosis, but there's a lot that goes into that because a person can live up to 20 years. It depends on factors. It depends on when are they diagnosed. 
somebody who's diagnosed at 85, which is after life expectancy anyway, the chances of them living another 20 years are slim just because of life expectancy. And then you take other comorbidities into account as well. We've got to keep in mind that last bullet point. This is not something they have control over. And it isn't anything that they caused. They didn't do anything to make it happen. Most of y'all have heard us say multiple times, they're not giving you a hard time, they're having a hard time. What we want to focus on, though, is what remains. Instead of focusing on what's lost, let's focus on what remains. Their feelings and emotions are going to be there throughout the entire course of the disease. What's interesting is that physical strength remains, especially in the hands. So the thumb, the pointer finger, and the middle finger, those are fine motor skills, and those will start to go away pretty early. But the pinky and the ring finger is strength and can grab. Think about that little bitty baby in the crib that can grab hold of your hand and your finger and they'll hold on to it. A person even at the end stage of Alzheimer's disease can still have a lot of physical strength. Those lifetime habits will stay for a very, very long time, especially if they're related to music. That basic instinct to survive and thrive, their senses are going to change, but they're going to remain personality preferences many times stay intact. The ability and being able to make connections with other people remains till the end of their life. The ability to understand body language, tone, and gestures remains till the end of their life because that's controlled by the amygdala in the brain. And it doesn't receive, it doesn't have near as much damage as the hippocampus does. They can distinguish between different types of touch and we want to focus on what remains. We're going to watch another short video about specifically what's going on in the brain of somebody with Alzheimer's disease. In healthy people, all sensations, movements, thoughts, memories, and feelings are the result of signals that pass through billions of nerve cells or neurons in the brain. Neurons constantly communicate with each other through electrical charges that travel down axons, causing the release of chemicals across tiny gaps to neighboring neurons. Other cells in the brain, such as astrocytes and microglia, clear away debris and help keep neurons healthy. In a person with Alzheimer's disease, the most basic form of dementia, toxic changes in the brain destroy this healthy balance. These changes may occur years, even decades, before the first signs of dementia. Researchers believe that this process involves two proteins, called beta amyloid and tau, which somehow become toxic to the brain. It appears that abnormal tau accumulates, eventually forming tangles inside neurons. And beta amyloid clumps into plaques, which slowly build up between neurons. As the level of amyloid reaches a tipping point, there is a rapid spread of tau throughout the brain. But tau and beta amyloid may not be the only factors involved in Alzheimer's. Other changes that affect the brain may also play a role over time. The vascular system may fail to deliver sufficient blood and nutrients to the brain. The brain may lack the glucose needed to power its activity. Chronic inflammation sets in as microglial cells fail to clear away debris and astrocytes react to distressed microglia. Eventually, neurons lose their ability to communicate. As neurons die, the brain shrinks, beginning in the hippocampus, a part of the brain important to learning and memory. People may begin to experience memory loss, impaired decision-making, and language problems. As more neurons die throughout the brain, a person with Alzheimer's gradually loses the ability to think. Remember, make decisions, and function independently.
Achieving a deeper understanding of the molecular and cellular mechanisms and how they may interact is vital to the development of effective therapies. Much progress has been made in identifying various underlying factors. Advances in brain imaging allow us to see the course of plaques and tangles in the living brain. Blood and fluid biomarkers are providing insights about when the disease starts and how it progresses. More is also known about the genetic underpinnings of the disease and how they can affect particular biological pathways. These advances enable the development and testing of promising new therapies, including drugs that reduce or clear the increase of tau and amyloid proteins in the brain, therapies targeting the vascular system, glucose metabolism, and inflammation, and lifestyle interventions like exercise or diet, and behavioral approaches like social engagement that may enhance brain health. Research is moving quickly, ever closer to the day when we can delay or even prevent the devastation of dementia. And that's what we want to hear, is that they are moving forward with the research. Just in my career, they are finally to the point where we can get a diagnosis without it being at autopsy, because there was a time when you could not get a firm diagnosis of Alzheimer's until autopsy. And it's a little bit late to be getting your diagnosis at that point. So here's that photo I was telling you about. On the left, we have a three pound brain. This is a 70 year old man who passed away in a car accident. On the right, we have a one pound brain from a 70 year old man who passed away from the end stage of Alzheimer's disease. A three pound and a one pound brain. Look at that atrophy, the way that it has shrunk. And what you're seeing there, those are holes. The cells are dying, which means that their abilities are lost. But again, we've got to focus on the ones that remain. That's a really powerful picture. We use this a lot with our teaching, especially when we are the one who's the caregiver. And we've got to remember they didn't do anything to make this happen. And they're not doing it on purpose. How do we get that diagnosis? We always want to start at the primary care physician, always, because there are some things that cause just memory loss without those other symptoms that we might could reverse, like a vitamin deficiency, an electrolyte deficiency, a severe depression, malnutrition. That can cause some memory loss. It doesn't cause dementia. So we can get to the primary care physician, get some blood work done. And from there, they very likely are going to send us to the neurologist, the geriatrician, to have some more tests and scans done. It's a battery of tests. It's a battery of tools. They're going to take a lot of things into consideration, including medical and family history. This is where it is so important that that family caregiver has been keeping a notebook. And if you're not doing it, I suggest that you start doing it immediately, keeping a notebook, what time of day, what was the behavior or the expression, start looking for a pattern. When did this start? You might be able to find a trigger. There's a variety of problem solving, memory, cognitive testing, neurological exams, physical exams, blood tests, ruling things out like tumors. I mentioned earlier medications. Now keep in mind, even though you'll hear these medications called memory meds, they're not reversing the disease, but they relieve symptoms, which means that the person with dementia can live well for a longer period of time. And the earlier we can start these medications, the more quality time we can buy. Now, that third bullet point's important. 
Effectiveness of these meds varies from each person and it lasts a limited time. Most of the time they will say, I saw a study who said, that said that these meds can last 18 to 24 months, but I've known people that have been on them for many, many years. So those are the most common that you see there, Aricept, Exelon, Namenda. Those are the ones that most people will say that uh, were prescribed to them. The, again, the earlier that we can get on the meds, typically um, we'll see more effects the earlier that we can get somebody on. The other things that are used is we will see people with dementia go on and off of antidepressants throughout the course of the disease, especially earlier in the disease, because they realize what's going on. They may not say it to you, they may not say it out loud, but we all know whenever something's happening with our body. They may be on medications for anxiety. That helps with the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Some people cannot take these medications that we're looking at here because of pretty severe nausea, stomach pain, diarrhea. It's different for everybody. But there are other things that we can do for treatment because our goal with all of the dementias is to maximize independence, to make sure they keep their dignity and quality of life all the way through the course of this disease. So that is gonna be our first intervention is we're going to learn those behavior interventions, how to distract, how do I need to talk, to respond rather than react. That's why we have support groups. Our goal is that we're looking for effective management and trying to use the least amount of medications possible or going on and off of medications. Especially early in the disease, we wanna keep their life and their routine as normal as possible. In fact, we're gonna talk about in just a little bit, we even call that first stage of the disease normalization. Other things we can do, you saw in that last video where they talked about exercise and they talked about diet and they talked about socialization, making sure that we keep our loved one or our clients uh, familiar with all of these other things that can still bring pleasure and still bring quality of life for not only the person with dementia, but also for that caregiver. Cognitive stimulation doesn't mean sitting in front of the TV eight hours a day. There's nothing wrong with the TV, but when that's all that they have to do, they may find another way to keep themselves busy. It might not necessarily be something that we want them doing. Making sure that our caregivers are learning validation therapy, how to validate the feelings of the person with dementia, how to use music, again, throughout the course of the disease, because the side of the brain, that right side tends to remain longer than the left, and that's the rhythmic side of the brain, and music remains. Music's important. Doing intergenerational activities, bringing kids around, bringing those babies around, and staying social. So we're gonna go through the stages, kind of the early, mid, and late stages of Alzheimer's disease, and what it can look like. Again, we call this stage the normalization stage. We're making the best of the situation and we're starting to prepare for the future. Most people in the early stages of the disease can still do just about everything for themselves, but they need reminders, cues, setups, maybe a little bit of help. We may have to go in and clear off the vanity so that there's only the toothbrush and toothpaste and then we take that away and there's only the razor and the shaving cream and we take that away. Otherwise, that's too much stuff. They're going to get confused. Now, also early in the disease, some of these may not even be apparent and they may do a really good job at compensating or hiding it. What we have found, research does show us because folks will often say, but my loved one is very educated. They've got a PhD, they're a doctor, they've got a master's degree. 
doesn't matter. Dementia still, it doesn't matter if they've got a fifth grade education or a PhD. But what we have found is people with a higher level of education tend to be able to compensate or even hide it longer because they may have a higher vocabulary. So they may be able to uh, fool us for a little bit longer, or they may be the ones that are out buying those memory med vitamins that they read on TV, and then they're hiding them from us, and we find 50 bottles of them because they forgot that they bought them, or they're writing themselves notes. Close family and friends will start to notice. This is the time to start talking about the future and start talking about our wishes. Start talking about medications. And some of the first things we might see is problems with word finding. We may see that before we see memory loss. You know the thing. that th You know that thing. They're getting mad at you because you can't figure out the thing or the stuff. The stuff. You know the stuff. You know. You know. They're getting mad at you because they can't find the word. They may have a hard time performing tasks that they've been doing for years, or you may see them starting to withdraw from social settings, losing objects more often, and not being able to plan or to organize, even with things that they've been doing for many, many years. Some other common changes that we see pretty early, that immediate recall, not having immediate recall substituting words what's interesting is you'll see people substitute the wrong pronoun early in the disease now not everybody does this again because it is a very individualized disease but they may see their female doctor and she walks out of the room and they say what did he want that's pretty common there's no reason to correct that i'm gonna start a fight or something like that like I said earlier, they may get very easily irritated at you, the caregiver, and they may get really easily irritated at themselves. You may see a complete and total denial that anything's wrong. There's nothing wrong with me. It's you. There's something wrong with you. Shorten attention span, getting off task. They're in the middle of one thing. They go to do something else and completely forget about that first also, you may see them starting to have trouble interpreting background noises. So a background noise might be the air coming on. And you or I don't even hear it anymore, but they may hear it as something real, like shh, a really loud. They're having trouble just distinguishing what is, what is that. They can still hear, but their hearing is changing. As far as their personality goes, it may just be like they're not quite themselves. Something's just not right. You're starting to see a change and you see good days and bad days. Some more things we see early. They may use humor or anger to avoid questions. I used to do assessments on folks and they would tell when I might ask them the date and they'd say something like, I'm retired. I don't need to know the date. Good answer for telling me you don't know what day it is. Or they'd say, uh, well, you ought to know. Okay. And what they're saying to me is, I don't know. Limited decision making. And again, depression, withdrawal. And they may very well not even be aware of what's going on. Even if you point it out over and over and over, they truly may not be aware of what's going on. And this is a lot of information on these slides, but you're getting a copy of these slides. So don't worry about trying to get all of this written down. I want to get over here to the routine. Early in the disease, this is so important to make sure that we're keeping a routine. And you see a picture of a very large whiteboard. I used to go in people's homes and help them stay home as long as possible. And the use of a whiteboard was something that I found families used over and over and over again. Now, it doesn't have to be this big, but I had an awful lot of folks who did use one this big because they put specific 
to the day. You can see there they've got 1030 to 1120, 1130 to 1220, 1220 to 1. I mean, it is specific. And then they would kind of... Um, teach their loved one when they were asking the same question over and over and over, go look at your whiteboard, go look at your whiteboard, go look at your whiteboard, using the same tone, same words every time. And I'd walk in and catch, they'd just be studying those whiteboards. Now, this is as long as they can still read and they can still comprehend what they're reading, because eventually that's going to go away. So they've got to still be able to read and comprehend. Routine is important for both the person with dementia and that caregiver. Let's look at the middle stage. The middle stage we call supportive. It's a new reality. They're starting to need help with everything. They may not be walking any, they may be on a walker or possibly even already going into a wheelchair. We're going back to who they originally were and they were not originally walking. We're gonna see lots of changes in communication in the middle stage. This is the longest stage. Needing some assistance with most everything, not able to cut up their food anymore, and may eventually, even in the middle stage, put down the fork and go to the spoon or to finger foods. Starting to get a little more forgetful about their own personal history, and they may be starting to confabulate or make up stories about their personal history. Because they know I'm still supposed to have a personal history, but I don't know what it is, so I'll make it up. They're not lying. There's a difference in a lie and a confabulation. There really is. They're doing their best to still be able to be social and be able to talk with us. Lots of confusion about date and time. In fact, that may completely be gone. I'll tell families, don't even use uh, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. Let's use daytime, nighttime, afternoon, morning those type words. We learned those words first. Sleep changes. Wandering away, leaving, elopement, getting lost. Other changes in the middle. Again, those major gaps in memory and major changes in conversation. And they may be starting to have something called word salad or where the, they're using actual words, but they're not making any sense anymore. Lots of reminders, lots of assistance. That's why this is supportive. Um, episodes of incontinence are starting to happen. We haven't always been able to toilet ourselves. And during this middle stage, we'll really start to see more incontinence using pads, possibly using briefs. Adults don't wear diapers. Make sure we don't use that word diapers. That's what children use. Dignity. They're sequencing again, having a hard time with sequencing. What's next? But this is where they will mirror and they will shadow us. They'll do what we're doing. So if we're brushing our teeth and we hand them, the, many, they'll still do it. They can still do it. They just need help. This may be where we start to really have some of those challenging behaviors or expressions because of anxiety. About 80% of the time when somebody has one of those challenging expressions, it's either because of the environment, they're overstimulated, or it was our approach. We didn't mean to do it. We would never do it on purpose, but it was our tone, our gestures, our body language that set off that challenging behavior. We can't come along and say things like, how are you? What did you have for breakfast? Because you might get a big old, I didn't even have any breakfast. And now you've opened up a door to have an argument. You'll also see people starting to use more body language themselves. For example, um, they're holding their stomach and they've got a furrowed brow and you ask them if their stomach hurts and they say no. But their body's telling you yes. No is one of the first five words that most people learned and they keep that word. So we have to look past the words, especially in this middle and late stage, and look at their emotions, their feelings, and their body language. 
increased suspiciousness and paranoia. You may see that early in the disease, but you may see it even when you're trying to poison me. Those people upstairs were keeping me up all night and there's not an upstairs. We go to their world. They kept me up too. I'm going to go talk to them about it. Let's go get some breakfast. Come on. That's validation therapy. Validating their feeling because it's real to them. Fixing it and distracting them away. They're going to be using a lot more of their actions and behaviors to communicate in this middle stage. And usually in the middle stage is when we can no longer leave them alone. The late stage is where we're going to focus on comfort, and this is a sensory stage. This is the time of maximum need, not only for the person with dementia, but also for that caregiver. And what we need to focus on in the late stage of Alzheimer's is quality of life. In the late stage, 24-hour care is going to be needed. Because they need now help with everything there's still going to be some things that they can do, but they're going to need assistance with everything. They very likely are not going to be walking. They very likely are going to be incontinent at this point. And they probably are gonna be down to about 10 words, 10 or fewer, no being one of them. Music remaining. There's gonna be changing in those physical abilities, even swallowing because we saw what was happening to that brain. The ability to metabolize food, the brain's dying. So they may still eat, but they're losing weight because the bodies can't metabolize the food anymore. Short-term memory is usually, it doesn't exist and that long-term is failing, but they are back to who they originally were. And they originally didn't have grandkids, kids, or even a spouse. They had a mama and a daddy, and they may look in the face of their wife and call them mom or their adult son and think it's their husband because they may be at a place where they do think they have a spouse, but not kids. They're going back. In stage of Alzheimer's, total care with their activities of daily living, bathing, toileting, shaving, brushing teeth. They may still be able to do some finger foods, possibly even a spoon, but they're probably going to be needing your assistance at mealtime, and this is the time that will go on hospice as well. Now, we always want to check for pain first, regardless of what's going on. So if someone is groaning, moaning, furrowed brow, always looking for that furrowed brow, something's going on. You might ask them, is your head hurt? No. Your stomach hurt? No. Something's going on, though, if they've got a furrowed brow and they're holding an area, we've got to really look for physical signs of pain. During this time, they may also stop wearing their glasses, hearing aids, or dentures because they hadn't always had them. I don't need them, and I don't even know what they are. And they disappear. They may have a lot of resistance to bathing. that care, or we're trying to help. Some muscle control, lots of changes in gross motor skills and fine motor skills. And you may see them develop what's called a flat affect, where it looks like they're not there, but we know they are there because their amygdala is intact. Now, I mentioned earlier this theory of retrogenesis, and when you get this slideshow, I'm going to encourage you to run off the next slide that we're going to look at. Here's the definition of it. The brain of a person with Alzheimer's disease deteriorates in the reverse order that the brain developed from birth. So let's look at this, and it's going to be hard to see on the screen. That's why I'm going to encourage you to run this off. You can look at this and see, let's say that your loved one was in the moderate stage and they fall into about a six or a, about, yeah, let's say about a six there on the scale where they are requiring assistance with dressing. They're needing some assistance with bathing, but they can still um, dress themselves. 
but we're having to help them. And you go over and you see develop middle age and it says four to five years old. So why we use this scale, ask yourself, what can a four to five year old do? They can still do a lot of their personal care. They can dress themselves, but they might come out with a tutu, cowboy boots and a unicorn horn on and they're ready to go to church. And our loved one might come out with four shirts, three sets of briefs pulled on and their cowboy boots and they're ready to go some. They can still do it, but they need assistance. That's one of the reasons the scale really, really helps us be able to see what's their ability and what's their skill set. What can they still do so that you and I can focus on what remains? That's the whole point. We want to nurture what remains in an individual with Alzheimer's. And the way you do that is by taking classes like this, educating yourself. The more you know about it, the better you're going to do on the journey and the better your loved one's going to do. Being able to have support for them and have support for yourself. People will often ask us, how do I know when it's time to place or if I need to place? And our answer is always safety safety, not only of the person with dementia, but for you also. And there's two types of safety. There's physical safety and there's emotional safety. Because sometimes the safe, sometimes that safety, we hit a wall and we just can't do another day. We haven't had any sleep. We're sleeping in the chair in front of the door to keep them from leaving at night. We're having to physically lift, bathe, change and our bodies just can't do it so physical and emotional safety not only of the person with alzheimer's but of the caregiver as well we've got a few minutes we're going to open it up for questions you will get a copy of these slides you'll also get a copy of this program and like jamie said earlier this program will load to our youtube page i believe jamie will be able to tell us if not by the end of the day tomorrow. So perfect. Yes. Um, Holly, there was one question in the chat um, about how do they know which type of dementia a person has? Or yep. person has. That's when um, you start with the primary care physician, you go through and you make sure that they have eliminated other things that can cause just memory loss, vitamin deficiency, thyroid disorder, uh, severe depression, those type things. You go to the neurologist, the neurologist that will then um, sometimes even send you to some other specialists, uh, but they do have tests and scans now so that they can see and determine what type of dementia. Another thing that they often do is they're eliminating okay it isn't parkinson's we know it isn't lewy body it isn't this up to 80 percent is alzheimer's it's alzheimer's uh here's what the symptoms look like so there's lots of testing involved now some people will also say do i need to make sure do they need to be able um do we have to get that uh, or can it just be dementia and some families especially if the per now if they're 58 versus 92 at 58 i may be going yeah i'm going to go find out exactly what this is we're at 92 i'm already over life expectancy this is i may not put them through all those tests uh i saw will the neuropsych tests show if it is now mixed or just a scan. The neuropsych won't be able to show if it's mixed um, because the most common that it's mixed with is vascular. And so if they've had some type of vascular issues, that doesn't necessarily, that's not going to show in a neuropsych. But that's going to be from taking a very good history and be able to see have they had uncontrolled high blood pressure did they have any type of a stroke those TIAs are our most common cause for vascular dementia um, cholesterol issues diabetes smoking 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 big 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 with vascular dementia um, history of alcohol history of drugs all of that they've got to take all of those into consideration
Why do the patients think there's always babies and people who are deceased around as they're going through the disease? And again, they're going back in time. They're going back to those people. That's why they'll start talking to their mamas and their daddies, because that's where they are. They don't have a husband or a wife. They've got a mama or a daddy. Um, now, babies, that's actually pretty common for people to see babies. I had a woman that would have lots and lots of babies under her bed, and we discovered she was watching Little House on the Prairie and then the Waltons back to back, and there's lots of kids in those shows, and it seemed like, and we were tracking behaviors, but then all those kids were somehow under her bed. Uh, so we had to go in and get those kids out from under her bed because we validated her feelings. Oh my goodness, look at all these kids in here. And we got them out from under the bed. We went to her world, distracted her away, but we never told her there weren't babies under the bed. So it's actually pretty common if somebody was a teacher, if somebody was a nurse, if somebody worked in childcare, um, that they may be seeing babies. They may also be telling you that they need a baby because sometimes women do really well, especially later in the disease, if they have a baby to take care of. Good questions. If y'all think of anything else on that last slide was mine and Jamie's email, and uh, you'll get it in the follow-up email from Jamie. Please reach out to us or call us if you think of anything else. We are right at time. I appreciate y'all being here today. I hope you can join us next month. And those of you that are interested, we do have a support group starting in 30 minutes. So uh, hope to see y'all later. Thank you for being on today. Bye.